Don't you think that it's just propaganda to say that uh, ch the Chinese or Russians are uh, against individualism, they are uh, more inclined to do something for the common good, because it's uh, obviously uh, better for the regime. It's yeah, convenient. I agree that sometimes it may be propaganda, but in many cases it's true. And also it may be both, right? So it, it may be propaganda that also like that also moves people in a certain direction. Because if propaganda is telling you every day that you are more less individualistic, that you would probably become less individualistic. That is reasonable, right? Because propaganda can be very efficient, and it is efficient in China, and it is quite efficient in Russia as well. Especially if it's not just propaganda, but if it's if it's thousand years of culture that is also moving in a certain direction. But also there are some research that show that it is not just propaganda. That is true. So for instance, um, Like there is an interesting study when people from different culture, there is, let's say there is one page and there is a rectangle on this page. And within this rectangle, there, there is a, like a line. And you, on the next page, you see, you, you, you look at this rectangle and you have to memorize how long is this line in, in terms of centimeters, for instance. And on the next page, when you close the previous page, uh, there is a rectangle of a different size. It can be larger or smaller and, your, and there is no line. And your task is to, is, to, is to draw the line, which is exactly the same size as the line on the previous page. And the problem is, It is easier for Western people to remember the absolute size of the line, but it's easier for Eastern people, for, for people from Japan or China, uh, to remember the relative size. So hmm. the difference in cognition patterns is that Western people uh, analyze objects separately, more analytically, but people from the East analyze them more in terms of relationships between different objects. And they remember the picture as a whole. But when they need to, to remember the absolute size, it's more tricky for them, which is interesting, yeah. It would be interesting to, to post a link to, the, to this study. Yeah, well, because it maybe will I, be in the description. Yeah, maybe I did not explain it like perfectly, but mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. That, that, that is indeed interesting. Well, maybe uh, philosophy and uh, mm. religion also plays a role. It should. Uh, of course. It's not gen I don't think it's genetically. Not it's definitely not genetically. No, no, not genetically, yeah. It's just, it's just culture. Okay, what else? What else are the most uh, striking differences? Mm, so apart from collectivism, um, Like in any other country, of course, uh, some smaller cultural differences, like how people eat, how do they behave, and maybe um, the, 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 the fact that Chinese people are less direct than uh, Americans or Russians or Europeans in general. They, and sometimes it may be challenging because I personally is quite direct and I like people like exchanging opinions very openly, but it's not always... Um, something great in China if you, if you share your opinion very honestly. So you should be cautious? Uh, kind of, kind of. And Speaking euphemisms? Uh, sometimes. Maybe, maybe mm, I would say that I personally, I like people who would say very directly to me what they think about me or about certain things, about politics, about, I don't know, art, whatever, uh, even if we are not very close friends. It is not the case in China and it is not the case in many other cultures. And that is something you have to get used to. Like, do not be too open about your opinions when you're just getting know someone, getting to know someone. Wait until you become really good friends, and then you can share some really, uh, like, um, because they can spy on you. The interesting thing is that China is creating a a, a political model that is so different from what we are used to in the West. And this model is very efficient and very effective. And this model may be more attractive for other countries in the world than the liberal model, because it, it, it helps you to, to get more economic growth. It helps you to, to get people out of the po poverty faster than the liberal recipes provided by the World Bank. And I think many people in the West, they just don't understand that. They think that 
we are living in the world of the 90s that when the Soviet Union collapsed and when the United States did the, the, the end of history, when the United States is the, is the only important political actor and there are no competitors, which is not true anymore because there is a real competitor and it's not only the competitor in terms of economic power, like many people think, but it's also a competitor in terms of like political models that this competitor is providing in terms of attractiveness as an ideal political, economic, social ideal. And this is much more dangerous than just having a big country that is growing. Uh, don't you agree with the fact that uh, uh, this model is uh, a bit threatening? It looks like it's an uh, empire of evil, maybe even. Um, I would disagree with the empire of evil. I, I don't like to call anyone like pure evil, but of course it's scary, and it's and it's scary from especially from the Western liberal perspective. It is scary. It is scary in terms of how much control does the government have over its citizens. It's true. It's scary in terms of uh, how much power citizens have in terms of like the the the, the degree of democratic autonomy they don't really have much and for us it is scary but it's also important to understand that people have different priorities and for many of them they are not suffering and because of that they are not thinking there is something wrong with this system and I, i i'm pretty sure i mean i've never seen any data on that but i'm pretty sure that the overwhelming majority of people in china are fully satisfied with the political system but don't you think that uh, in the Stalin, USSR, uh, most people probably uh, didn't realize until it was too late that oh, yeah. uh, that it uh, it really sucked <laughs> living that, there. That is true. That is so true. They were satisfied. And China maybe. has its own problems that are huge, like all these camps for people who disagree with the regime, for Muslims, etc., etc. And we should talk about these problems, but yeah, we we shouldn't assume that China or Chinese people are dreaming about becoming more like the United States. Democratic and yeah, open. Because that is not necessarily true. It may be true, but we shouldn't assume that. We shouldn't take it for granted. Uh, what uh, can happen to you if you start expressing uh, uh, controversial statements about uh, China? You're not a citizen of China, but still you s you're saying things about these uh, camps, concentration camps for Uyghurs and uh, other oppressed minorities. Aren't you afraid that they can do something to you? I don't think it would happen. Like, um, first of all, if it's if it becomes incredibly like popular and I don't know, millions of people can see that, yeah, is it may be it may be kind of questionable. But also many people talk about this and that is fine. Like many journalists that are working in China can still talk about these camps. And nothing happens to them. Nobody just like uh, disappears out of some <laughs> uh, out of thin air. Yes. No, as far as I know, people do not disappear. Like Western journalists do uh -huh. not disappear. That is a little bit different. Um Yeah, I would say the Chinese state does give a little bit more power to Western journalists. They can, it can ban them from entering the country from time to time. So, for instance, sir, several journalists, if I remember correctly, from the Wall Street Journal, were banned, were denied visas. Uh, What be for? Because Wall Street Journal published an article, the the real sick man of the world, referring to China and its inefficiency with fighting the virus and with many other, like inefficiency of its, of its economic and political system, like sick man referring to the Ottoman Empire uh, before the the, yeah. the First World War. And yeah, yeah, you understand the reference. So they and. People who were banned, who were denied the visas, were not the people who who have written the article. But it was the signal. So if you're publishing articles like that, like criticizing China with no reason... You cross the line. You cross the line. So you shouldn't do that. And yeah, and it, it, the, the situation is similar with the case of Blizzard that you mentioned or with the case of NBA. So China is like realizing that it has more, more and more power and it can like slightly push... Western companies and even media to to change its, its the way they are presenting China. I don't think it would work with Western media at least now because I think they value autonomy and 
like freedom of expression more than even access to the Chinese market. And they don't really have any any issues with the access uh, with the access uh, to the Chinese market because they're not there. They don't, <laughs> they're not getting any money from from the market. So usually, for instance, several media outlets, websites are banned in China. I don't remember exactly the name, but maybe like something like New York Times, for instance, is banned. And I'm not YouTube sure. and Facebook. Yeah, as YouTube well. and Facebook are banned. But the thing is that uh, journalists from these outlets are allowed to to be in the country, and they have like bureaus and offices in Beijing to write about China, but to write only to the Western audience. Mm -hmm. So that's why I don't think they would care so much about people talking about like Uyghurs and, and these problems. <laughs> <laughs>